Thanks, Odette, and it's a pleasure to be back at the second uh, debates in colorectal surgery here in um, Jerusalem. It's a pleasure to see our alumni and make some new friends, as always. Kept you here late to hear about fecal incontinence, I guess saving the best for last, or at least ensuring that nobody here has any urgency to leave before the end of the talk. <laughs> Incontinence is uh, multifactorial. Well, not while that traffic's out there, I gather. It's multifactorial. It's more common in, in, in women and, and largely because of childbirth. Now, some of that is due to the multiper, multiparity and stretching sphincters and stretching nerves, but some due to the actual deficits caused either by an episiotomy or a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery. Repair of the sphincter used to be touted as 75%, 85%, 90% successful, but over time that's really waned. And I want to go into a little bit of the evolution uh, with the treatment of fecal in incontinence. And I, I think it, it's easiest to group things in categories with anything we evaluate and manage. I think four logical groupings here are repair, augmentation, replacement, and stimulation. If you think of it in those broad brush strokes, you can kind of figure where you'd like to target different therapies and what you'd like to apply in different patients. So I'm going to touch on these things. And when, when we started our training program in, in Fort Lauderdale in, in 1989, we had available only the top two, repair and uh, sphinx repair and postanal repair, and a stoma. And that essentially was it. And since that time, all of these other things have come online in relatively recent history. So we went decades and decades and decades with very little offer the patient, and all of a sudden there's just a plethora of things out there, and there are new things pretty much every day uh, on the market. Sphincter repair, again, used to be thought of as successful in the vast majority of patients, and it probably is successful in the majority of patients for a short period of time. It may improve sensation, it may improve motor function, it may improve control, it may improve quality of life, but it tends to do so for a pretty short time. And when you look at the most recent meta-analysis just out last month, you can see all of the studies trending down. These are studies in which the same group of patients was followed at different points in time, and the scores were, were tracked and outcomes were tracked. And you can see that it's the best case scenario, you might have 60% long-term success, but you might also have zero. And the blend is probably somewhere 15 to 25% tenure long-term success. So we need to do something other than just try and make the muscle tighter or fix the defect. What could we do? Well, injectables are relatively simple because they can be done either in the office as an outpatient or endoscopy or outpatient surgery with some type of injection. The top one pictured there are the carbon beads, and Rick Weiss was our lead investigator in, in the carbon protocol. We did a pilot of, of 10 patients, but there are many, many other things that are out there that can be injected, submucosally or intersphincteric. And then there's radiofrequency, which actually has a very big predicate history with gastroesophageal reflux disease and the strata procedure. So if we look at some of the injectables, I think the the simplest is autologous fat, and um, uh, Ahmed Shafiq had come up with the idea of patients uh, willing to undergo liposuction, which most everyone seems to be. You could just kind of take the patient's own fat and, and, and inject it back in the area of the sphincter, but that never really caught on anywhere else. And others came up with things, PTFE, bioplastique, you can read the list for yourself, uh, Rick Weiss's study on, on carbon beads, pretty reasonable improvement but not dramatic improvement in most cases. And there's been several studies showing significant quality of life at a breakpoint of an incontinence score of 10. So 10 is kind of a magic number. You'd like to get to 10 or less to show improvement. So for the most part, people are getting there, but, but not great improvements. Looking at a few other things, contagen, PTQ, uh, permacol, as is used in, in MeSH. Norman Williams has been a champion of that. Oliver Schwanner, one of our alumni from, from Germany, and most recently the Celesta trial, which is actually the only commercially available FDA-approved compound in the U.S., Celesta, and it's basically a kind of variant on what Seprafilm is made of. It's sodium hyaluronate, but in a, in a different chemical composition. And you can see significant improvement in this uh, randomized controlled two-to-one uh, trial. Tracy Hull participated in this, one of our alumni, Mitch Bernstein, uh, Graf, and, <clears throat> and Anders Melgren. 
but you can see that the, the morbidity is relatively low and keep those numbers in mind when we look at some of the other surgical procedures. Short-term success, reasonable. Long-term success, seemingly reasonable. The question is, in whom do you inject these compounds? And it's not one size fits all. And I think what you've got to pay attention to is we're going through this talk is that there are different treatments, but there are also different types of patients with fecal incontinence. One of the problems with the injectables globally, they're, they're easy to use. Again, you can do it in the office. Maybe you can do it in, in endoscopy or outpatient surgery if you prefer. But for the most part, this can be done in the office. The question is, how much do you inject? Where do you inject it? Do you inject it intersphincteric, submucosal? Do you inject it in one quadrant, four quadrants, three 120 degree intervals, circumferentially? What volume do you inject? None of this is really known, and every trial does things quite, quite differently in terms of, of injection, and that is a potential problem. And it makes it difficult to compare studies because the methods of injection vary greatly. This is Oliver Schwander's study, and you can see, for example, a decrease in incontinence score, but really not to the point of improved quality of life in the majority of, of patients. So there's some slight improvement, but not really anything like we'd like to see, not that significant improvement that we'd like to appreciate. Um, after 20 months, again, you can see some improvements, but not dramatic. So is this a treatment for everyone? No, but maybe for patients with mild degrees of, in of incontinence. The largest study for injectables, again, was this Celesta study published at the end of last year in Lancet, and you can see the inclusion criteria, and they wanted to get a score over 10s so that they'd have uh, poor quality of life or suboptimal quality of life anyway, two to one randomization between the active arm and sham, I mentioned that already, and then after six months, the trial was unmasked. Patients in the sham treatment arm were offered active treatment. Patients in active treatment were also offered repeat treatment after one month if the score was still 10 or greater and they had no adverse effects. Then the patients were followed up at these intervals of every three months. They had a pretty robust enrollment with over 200 patients randomized. Reduction of uh, incontinent episodes by 50% or greater was defined as success. And you can see the success rate increased from 50, uh, from 31% in the sham group to 52%. So an improvement, although again, the sham group got exactly what you'd expect for placebo, one out of three improved. But it's better than that. They got up to 52%. The newest injectable is the Carlo Ratto uh, gatekeeper that he's been popularizing around the world. And we're about to start a U.S. trial uh, on the gatekeeper. It's been used a little bit in South America, mostly in Italy. And it's a thin, solid uh, cylinder that kind of shortens and therefore shortens the anal canal and bulks it, and it's just injected in these various quadrants. Carlo's uh, initial study in British Journal of Surgery was 14 patients putting in four implants at 90 degree intervals per patient under endo-anal ultrasound guidance in the interesphincteric space, following patients for about three years, and you can see the improvements here going, down, going from 12.7 to 4.1, and being maintained, so seemingly better than the other injectables, not enough data out there yet. Again, promising, we're going to have, I believe, it's seven U.S. centers participating in a gatekeeper trial. It's just now getting underway. The other form of injection, if you, if you will, is radiofrequency. It's an injection of energy as opposed to a chemical uh, substance. Radiofrequency works by putting a device in the anus and then deploying four electrodes. So what you see, each of these is an electrode, and it will read out temperature range, the minimum and maximum accepted temperatures, and then the maximum impedance. So if the temperature in the probe exceeds the set maximum, or if the impedance exceeds the maximum, that one electrode will cut out. Each of these then shows the four quadrants, there's water being dripped in to cool the quadrant as it works, and this little clock shows 60 seconds because each application is 60 seconds. So basically four prongs are deployed. There's a transparent anoscope, so you can start these applications half centimeter below the dentate line, then at the dentate line, one half one, one and a half above dentate line in four quadrants, anterior, left, right, posterior. So a total of basically 80 energy applications through these electrodes spaced out uh, five millimeters each. And again, the predicate is strata. So you have 20 at the moment randomized controlled or cohort studies which have been recently 
presented at, at DDW. It's the same principle, though, and this is how it started. The, the, the radio frequency device was designed by a guy named David Utley, who's an ENT surgeon at UCSF, and he thought of it with the esophago gastro duodenoscope for spot welding here for GERD. And this is the same time as, in, as some other devices came on the market for GERD. And when you look at some of the data for GERD, there's a lot more patients being treated than there were with SECA for fecal incontinence, but you can look at the, the studies and the number of patients per study. There's a couple thousand patients overall that's been treated, and those patients were followed up for about maximum of two years, but significant improvements in the gastroesophageal uh, reflux, quality of life scores, SF36, physical and mental, heartburn scores, satisfaction, and objectively lower esophageal pressure. So there's something to it that works in the esophageal sphincter. The question is, does it also work in, in, in the anal sphincter? Um, the GI folks and the upper GI surgeons feel that it is a good alternative to medical treatment or surgical fundoplication. How does it work at our end, so to speak? Well, there's a lot fewer data out there, and many of these are repeat data sets. Takahashi in Mexico City had the same patients published with 12-month follow-up, 24-month follow-up, added a few more patients for 60-month follow-up. Uh, John Efron published here our data combined with Cleveland Clinic Naples at the time and Cleveland Clinic Ohio at the time. Short follow-up, uh, a couple of other studies, Ruiz, again, is our data set, followed up, and Maher Abbas is a more recent study. But you can see the common denominator is the scores do fall, perhaps not as dramatically as they necessarily do with Solesta, and maybe not as dramatically as they do with, when this same type of technology is used for GERD. However, quality of life improved in every study. So I think that is important. And I think what this provides, and the injectables, both radio frequency and injectables, is a kind of early warning system. There's some type of a collagen reformation, which is easier for me to understand with radio frequency than injectables, that allows the patient a better first sensation and therefore defer the urge to go to the toilet and wait and not have an accident. And I think that's a lot of, of how it works. What I like about this technology is it's reproducible. You put in the probe, you pull the trigger, the prongs are deployed. With the injectables, there are a lot of variables. The angle of injection, submucosal intersphincteric that have to be worked out. This kind of standardizes it. Now, if we get away from the injectables, the so-called augmentation uh, therapies, and we go to the replacement therapies, the first one is the dynamic gracilloplasty, which, again, was devised simultaneously on Rico Cavina in Pisa and Norman Williams in London and, and Corbaton in Maastricht. And it is a, is the predicate is taking the muscle out of the leg for kids with imperfect anus, wrapping it around the anus, and then suturing, not the tendon as, as Lois Barnes is showing here in Corman's textbook, but suturing the muscle, as I'm showing photographically, to the other, to the contralateral ischial tuberosity, implanting a pulse generator with an electrode either on or around the nerve to the gracilis muscle. There are a lot, a lot of variables in this operation. How do you wrap the muscle, alpha, epsilon, or gamma configuration? Do you suture it to the ischial tuberosity on this side or on this side? Or do you suture it to the skin, as some people did? Do you make it so you know, tight around your finger with the legs adducted or abducted or neutral? Do you maybe make it a little loose and leave room for contraction? How deeply do you tunnel it? I mean, and these are the variables just related to that part of it. What kind of electrode do you use? What settings do you use? And all of those complexities, I think, lead to some of the problems that we had here in our 129 patient study, where we did have success patients without stomas, about half of patients at two years with significant improvements in quality of life, but with very high rates of morbidity, 40 to 77 percent morbidity with revisional rates of surgery equally high, up to 77 percent. So, Yes, the success can be good with dynamic gracilloplasty, but at a very, very high cost. Again, it's a balance. One treatment has low morbidity, injectables, radiofrequency, but a marginal efficacy relative to the efficacy you can get from stimulating a skeletal muscle, but the cost of this one is, of course, much higher. The artificial bowel sphincter has been on the market until about a year and a half ago, was on the market until 1999. The company voluntarily 
we're told, withdrew it, uh, to um, tweak the device a little, largely having to do with the pump itself that needed some tweaking, and these do occasionally leak. But the way it works, again, is it's wrapped around any existing sphincter, as cephalat as one can put it, with the pump in the labus majorum or in the scrotum and the balloon in the space of retzius. So this is a, a passively filling a hydraulic device, unlike the stimulated gracilloplasty, which is an active electronic device. The gracilloplasty, you would put a magnet against the stimulator to turn it off, and the patient's done evacuating, they put a magnet to turn it back on. This is passive in that the patient squeezes the pump. Each time they squeeze, about half cc of fluid comes out of the cuff and goes into the balloon, and over the next two to four minutes, the cuff fills again from the reservoir. So that's a passive hydraulic system uh, from the balloon into the cuff using the pump. What are the outcomes of the operation? Again, pretty high rates of infection across the board, pretty high rates of explantation, good function if you can get the patients through the problem with morbidity. We looked at our data fairly recently pretty profoundly incontinent group of patients with a mean score of 18, a lot of patients with imperfect anus or other types of trauma. We had 41% of patients with infection divided into early and late. We could not find any variable which predicted uh, success or failure on univariate analysis, but on multivariate analysis, we found that the time between implantation of the bowel sphincter and the first bowel movement or a history of perianal sepsis, those two factors augured for infection in the early stage. The late failures, however, were usually mechanical device malfunction, and again, the device is now being retooled. That now gets us to the newest, most popular kit on the block, if you will, sacral neuromodulation. It's also the same company, it's Medtronic, it's the same device, it's an interstim although they make a, a smaller, newer one as well now, the Interstim 2, but it basically feeds through this battery for a period, depending on the voltage settings, for a period of 5 to 10 years, it will feed through these electrodes, so this is a timed lead, these little tines will rest once it's implanted somewhere in this vicinity between the uh, sacrum and the um, subcutaneous tissue, in the fascia, but usually it's between the anterior and posterior table. So these little guys will rest in and prevent your pulling it out. They're a little bit like barbs on, a, on an arrow. So once they're in, they're hard to get out. But at the end, there are four electrodes just distal to that, stimulated by this pulse generator. The electrodes are put along, ideally, S3, and you want to get at least two, but ideally all four leads in contact with the nerves at the lowest possible voltage to give the best possible shot at success. The operation was first done by, um, uh, by uh, Klaus Matzel in 1994, or something like that, in Erlangen, so it's almost 20 years. The results were first published in about 1999 and 15 patients were subsequently published by Kenefic, and you can see very dramatic improvements, much more so than with any of the other things we've discussed, plus full continence. None of the other series really have full continence. They have improvements, but not total perfect control, plus urgency improved. And other than radio frequency, no other study has shown improvements in urgency, and I think that's because there's a major sensory component to SNS. It's not just a motor treatment. In fact, it may not be a motor treatment at all. If you think about it, sphincter repair, you're trying to tighten it. The augmentation, whether with injectables or radio frequency, or maybe trying to make it a little smaller uh, and snugger, certainly artificial bowel sphincter and stimulated gracilloplasty or non-stimulated muscle transfers, you're trying to make it tighter and smaller. This is largely sensory. S3 is a mixed nerve, so you're improving sensation and also motor function, but also at a very minimal morbidity, probably because you're not operating around the anus. You're staying far away from the anus with this procedure. So look at some of the results here. Follow up again, relatively short in, in most of the studies, but look at the tremendous drop, 16 down to 2, 17 down to 2, 11 to 0, 16 to 2, uh, 16 to 5. I mean, big, profound drops, improvements in fecal uh, incontinence scores. More recent studies here, this being the most recently just presented by Tracy Hull a few weeks ago at the ASCRS, 
This is our national 120 patient study, now followed for five years and still maintaining improvements. This is fecal incontinence episodes per week, but you can see dramatic improvements in these scores in all patients. So looking at a, a meta-analysis of 34 studies, you can see significant improvements in all of these areas, but very importantly, I think, in this one, the ability to defer evacuation. The fact that these patients have better sensation differentiates it from the various other therapies, as does a very low rate of explantation as compared to uh, stimulated gracilloplasty or artificial bowel sphincter, and it does come along with improvements in SF36 and fecal incontinence quality of life. Our North American study, to which I alluded, we first presented at Hollywood at the ASRS meeting in 2009. You can see the patients in the study, and about a 73% improvement in fecal incontinence in these patients. Graphically, you can see it mapped out, very marked improvement in weekly incontinence episodes, weekly urge incontinence episodes, improvements in quality of life maintained at that point through three years but no change in manometry. So it's not a matter of just making it smaller or tighter or squeeze better. The sensory component can't be underestimated, which again is why I think that radiofrequency has something going for it because of a kind of tissue remodeling. It's not just a static procedure. But again, more work needs to be done on that. Improvements in fecal incontinence severity index, bowel health, all of these things. With a lower morbidity than we see with some of the other advanced procedures like gracilloplasty or artificial bowel sphincter. Implant site pain being the most common, infection, many of which were successfully treated with antibiotics. The diarrhea was usually related to antibiotics given at the time of surgery. If we look at infection in this group, unlike the artificial bowel sphincter group, again, we didn't really see that we could make head or tail just like our artificial bowel with any of these variables, but the big difference was Unlike the stimulated gracilloplasties and the ABSs, these patients usually responded in the early phase to oral antibiotics. So we were able to, unlike for those other two procedures, generally safely treat these patients efficaciously and successfully treat these patients with antibiotics, but not in the late stage. Late infections, though, were usually really secondary infections. When you talk to these patients, it's usually because they're riding their motorcycle, they got thrown from a horse, they fell down a flight of steps. I mean, either they were doing something they should not have been doing. We had one we explanted recently, and the lady, you know, was swore up and down. She wasn't riding her motorcycle, but one of the residents saw her leaving the parking lot on her motorcycle. So, you know, good luck. So people do things they're not supposed to do, or are unfortunate, like falling down steps, and it's going to happen. But the early infections can be treated with antibiotics. The three-year data were presented last year by Anders Melgren, and one of the nice things here versus many of the other procedures is there's no attrition in results. So we have similar therapeutic outcomes over time. You can see there's no waning in the result with these patients. And what this is showing is the degree of improvement. So this is 100% improvement perfect bowel control, incontinence score of zero, roughly 40%. And when we layer on the 75% improvements, the scores are perhaps less than four. We're up to about 75% of patients have perfect or near perfect bowel control, which of course supports why their fecal incontinence quality of life is better. Again, no, improve, no uh, increase in infection at the three-year follow-up, and even at the five-year follow-up, you can see here success is maintained even at this point, 36% at complete continence. You can see the scores as we start following out further. Donato Altamare's data, 15.4 uh, down to 5.5. Fully continent, 18%. You can see the percent improvement in Altamare's study, very similar to what we saw, a median of 70% improvement. We had about 70, 75% as well. Improvements in quality of life in the five-year data. The Danes have six-year data now. And you can see here a similar size study. They had 126 patients with the SNS implanted. Very similar etiologies to our North American trial. They had a couple of S4s. They explanted 12% overall at a mean, median of about a year. But you can see as they march out to six years, improvements in incontinence don't really wane. There's not a big attrition here. They're able to maintain that improvement. And out to 10 years, Klaus Matzel, who of course was the first implanter back in 94, looked at his first group of patients. And even at a decade out, in the first patients before he passed his learning curve, 
you can see complications were 33%, which is not that high after a decade in the very first patients. And he's able to maintain that score 10 or better even 10 years out. So a lot of, of, of very good press about it. Uh, Ratto's tried to look and see what might augur for success or failure in patients with SNS. Ten studies with 119 patients met these criteria. 89% uh, were able to be selected as studies. And he was able to, again, reiterate that patients had improvements in scores, improvements in the ability to, to defer call to evacuation, better quality of life, no changes in manometry, and there was nothing else he could really say. If you get pudendal neuropathy, didn't auger for failure, sphincter defect up to 120 degrees, didn't auger for failure. So people have been pushing the envelope. And now we see with SNS patients who've had rectal resections being operated on, patients who've had prior rectal prolapse surgery, pelvic floor injury, radiation, spinal cord injury. Because of the success and safety of that procedure, it's really being applied to many, many other areas. This is a, I'll leave you with this one, which is kind of an interesting comparison done out of France where they looked at sacral nerve stimulation, artificial bowel sphincter, not randomized control, but sequentially performed. And they have 15 SNS patients versus 15 matched ABS patients using these various scores. Because they were doing ABS before SNS, there's longer follow-up in those patients as compared to the SNS patients. What they found was kind of interesting that the incontinence scores were actually somewhat more greatly improved with artificial bowel sphincter, but at a price, and the price was worsening constipation. So you can make the sphincter too tight with an ABS, which you wouldn't do with an SNS. <coughs> Therefore, they concluded the SNS is still the first line. Having said that, there are patients who've had imperfect anus or severe trauma, and they're not candidates. You can't put in sacral nerve stimulator because there's no muscle. It's one thing to take a patient with a 120 degree defect and, and put in an SNS. It's another thing when there's no muscle or the muscle is severely fragmented. That patient does need something else, a muscle or an artificial bowel sphincter. But if it is an isolated defect, say it's not somebody with imperfect anus, it's not somebody with a fragmented sphincter. Let's say it is an isolated defect. If they've got a neuropathy you might want to go to sphincter repair, but you might, based on the literature, say, let's just go to something else. We know you're not going to have a good long-term result with sphincter repair. Why don't we go to one of these other procedures? But let's say they, they have normal nerves. You might still want to try a sphincter repair, though there's an increasing body of evidence suggesting that if you have a defect of less than 120 degrees, you still may be able to offer the patient primary SNS. If you choose to do a sphincter repair and it succeeds, mazel tov, that's great. If it fails, then you've got to decide, did it fail because anatomically it fell apart and you're back to here? Or what's usually the case, you do your ultrasound, you examine, maybe you do an MRI, it's an intact repair, but yet they're still incontinent. Well, that patient's going to need something else. So all of these patients are funneling onto this side of the diagram. And what do you do for them? You've got to choose. Do you want to do something so-called simple, whether injectable, radiofrequency, uh, I didn't even, have, because of time, go into this, but posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Do you want to go into gatekeeping? You know, one of the things in this category, or something perhaps more advanced. There's not a lot to direct us at the present time. We can exclude certain patients. We know, for example, if the patients had perianal sepsis, you probably shouldn't be injecting anything, radiofrequency or an injectable or doing an artificial bowel sphincter if they've got a history of perianal sepsis. If they have severe muscle loss, you're not going to be able to do something like a repair. Um, you're not going to be able to do SNS. You know, you can need something more like an ABS or a gracilis. Spinal deformity, it may be hard to do an SNS. There's a few things that can guide us, but this is the minority of patients. Most of them were just going to say, okay, you know, you've got an intact repair or no defect when we first met you and you're incontinent. Where do we want to go? We don't know. But I would say that you've got to discuss with the patient the severity of incontinence. And if the patient has an incontinence score that's going to be you know, four or six, it's probably not worth either the expense or the potential morbidity of an artificial bowel sphincter, or stimulated gracilloplast, or SNS. And you probably should go for something in this category. On the other hand, if the patient's got a score that's you know, 15, 20, 
you probably are going to want to go right to this area because the patient's not going to be interested in temporizing. But that's an opinion. There are no data. And you could just as easily justify, let's try radiofrequency if it works or injectable. And if it works, that's great. And if not, we can always go on to something else. You can do the same in reverse. You can say, let's do SNS. And if the patient's not improved, we can top it off. So over the next few years, now that all these procedures are out on the market, we're going to start to learn a lot more about which patient goes in which of these categories. The good news is there are a lot more things available now than there were a couple of years ago, and ultimately the patient has to be the one to decide how motivated is the patient and how willing are they to accept a major versus a minor procedure. Now, I don't know if time permits. I've got like two two-minute clips, but um, one is an ABS and one's an SNS. Just to show you the differences, if you're doing these, we, we whittle these down to about two minutes each. So we're putting a cuff for the sizer for the artificial bowel sphincter. You don't want to tierce. You want this thing a little bit loose because it's supposed to be dynamic. So once it's in place, you see a little bit of room with this clamp here. You want a little bit of room so when it's filled, it squeezes the anal canal shut. You don't want it tight when you've just wrapped it, right? Again, it's not a tierce procedure. We tunnel up to a space that we've made. Here's the abdominal field. So this is an incision in the space of Retzius. And we're going to bring the tubing out so the, the cuff gets tunneled up to the top. And then it's assembled at the top to the reservoir. And we test it to see how much fluid we need to keep the anal canal shut. So we have the right amount of fluid. It's usually between 4 and 8 cc's in the cuff and usually about 40 to 45 in the balloon. Use a Hagar dilator to put the pump in place and make sure when you place the pump, you place it so the patient can squeeze it. Don't do it sideways because they can't get to it and ask them which hand they use. It's very important. If it's a left-handed patient, you don't want it so they can't access it or right-handed, vice versa. So always ask the patient about dominant hand as you're placing it. Make sure it's as distal and as deep as you can get. Every component of this device that can erode has eroded, and I've seen it erode. The deeper, the better. Meticulous hemostasis, tons of antibiotic irrigation as you're doing it. There's this little device to crimp it and lock it in place. It's our concession to want to pretend to be orthopedic surgeons. We've got these little tools with this kit. Place it in. Make sure the tubing is deep under the rectus muscle. You don't want the tubing floating to the top, so if you have to reoperate to change a component, you injure the whole thing. The SNS we do in two stages. The first stage we put in the uh, percutaneous lead, and I use the timed lead so that if it's good position, we can leave it. So I'm marking under fluoro the sacral foramina. I want to have S3 foramina on both sides, and then a crosshatch at the sacroiliac notches. So I'm aiming for S3. It'll be about three centimeters above the sacroiliac notch at a 60 degree angle. And then I test with the non-stimulated part of the needle. This is off the field by the rep. And you'll see the foot and the toe respond. If you see the calf turn in, that's S2. You don't want to see that. You also want to see a bellows. The perineum will blow. And very importantly, you want the patient to tell you that they feel something in the perineum. If I have a choice of only sensory or only motor, I'll take only sensory. Preferably both, but I would, if I had a choice only one or the other, I'd pick the sensory, because that seems to be how it works. This is a Seldinger technique, like for central lines, so we put in the sheath, and then we get the lead in the sheath. We'd like to see under fluoro that we've got the uh, most superficial lead at the anterior sacral cortex. We'll retest, and again, we should see the toe motion, and we should see bellows, and the patient should tell us with each of the four leads that they feel something, ideally at no more than two to three volts for each instance. Then we take a picture, sometimes it's straight, sometimes it's a little more curved. We tunnel to a pocket where we're going to put this temporary extension for two weeks. The temporary extension then exits <coughs> through a separate stab wound, and for two weeks the patient has a device where they can externally adjust the settings, and we want to make sure that they have good sensation and ideally a 50% or greater improvement in the incontinence score or episodes if you prefer for that two weeks. We go in to move, remove the extension and place the interstim and, and this is quite 
an easy procedure. The patients awake, obviously, for the first with a bit of sedation. This one, they can be asleep if you want. We take out the lead, and with the new apparatus, there's no more temperate connector. It's now done as a, a single unit with a single set screw. It's, it's really quite easy. There's one single screw at the top. It used to be a temporary connector with then four screws in the device. I mean, it's exactly one screw. Even a colorectal surgeon can figure this out. So we tighten this down. you got to make sure the little blue at the lead is all the way at the end. So this is the smaller interstim too. Now, the good news is it's smaller. The bad news is it'll wear out quicker. It's got about half the battery life, it's half the size, so it may only last five years, and now we're intraoperatively programming it. Plus, the other bad news with the number of morbid obese patients, it's sometimes hard to feel this, and the patients have trouble programming it because it kind of disappears in, in a sea of, of adipose tissue, and you've got to be a little careful. I would They stopped making the interesting one. It was perfect for a lot of the patients that wander, waddle down the hall from Rosenthal's offices to ours, and now... We just have the interstim too. So with that said, and being a few minutes over time, the good news is we have a lot of treatments for incontinence. The bad news is we don't exactly know which one is best for each patient, but the good news is working together, I'm sure by the time we have the third debates in colorectal surgery, we'll be able to give people some more direction as to what the algorithm should look like for each individual patient. Thanks very much.